Hey, this is another episode, a special episode of Convo by Design, a Friday show, which can only mean one thing. It is another edition of Drinking About Design. Yes, Patrick Ettinger and I share thoughts about our love for Los Angeles architecture over a few pops. At least a few. We talk about nostalgia for the unique architectural landmarks of Los Angeles, uh, such as Norm's and the LA Coliseum. We talk about architecture and design in the age of social media, which isn't always a good thing. It's never a good thing. (laughs) Well, sometimes it is. Discussing mid-century modernism and googie architecture. We talk about Los Angeles traffic, nostalgia again in architecture. Speaking of googies and the resurgence of experimentation in Southern California, exploring Frank, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's architectural and human ego, his legacy, architecture, nostalgia, and revitalization uh, is discussed as well. You listen to this show because you know this about me. I love LA, but it's not the LA of my youth. And I'm not crazy about what has become of my city of angels. That said, I still have faith faith in the creatives to reimagine her, to reclaim her former glory. And I will be there to share the stories of that reinvention. That's my hope. And it all starts now. As I said, with Patrick, Ediger, over a few pops. It's funny, Patrick, because I had to learn the lesson over time, I would wind up having like these absolutely incredible, amazing conversations. And then it's like, you know what? I should probably hit record. I should yeah, you have to record everything it. to get it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So first, first question I have for you, you and I, you and I have never met before. We're first, we're speaking for the first time. And I love right. that we're, we're drinking while we do it. We're just having a couple of pops and talking architecture. What else could you want? Exactly. It's it's Friday afternoon. It's five o'clock, well, at least on the, the West Coast. It's five and, o'clock where you uh, are, seven o'clock where I am. It's all good. <laughs> it's time okay, for a cocktail. First question I, first, well, first question I had for you is yes. hard G or soft G? Uh, hard G. Edgar. Edgar. Like, okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Do you Thank get you. that a lot? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And I've gotten everything from Ediger to Ediger. So... <laughs> Uh, if you want to go European. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, all right. So what are we drinking this evening? I am having an old-fashioned. Uh, it's, it's what I had. You know, I when um, when I was thinking about this, I thought, what am I going to drink? And I thought, I should have something, a classic LA, you know, something that was invented here. And the only thing you could come up with was a Mai Tai. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? That's like, if you have a traditional Mai Tai, that's like 10 ounces of booze. I don't think so. So. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, was it? Now, I don't know this to be a fact. I'm just wondering, it wasn't the Mai Tai created at Trader Vic's? Was that? Was that's that, right. That's right? Exactly. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I've, I am a native Angelino. So I was at the original Trader Vic's. Now you were not. No, a it was Angelino. Angelino. long before I moved here. Okay, you're not a native Angelino. Where are you from? No. So I'm from um, western Nebraska, uh, hmm. a small rural town called Scotts Bluff. And um, yeah, I've been in, actually, this is really fortuitous. This is my 20 year anniversary in Los Angeles. In fact, in Congratulations. three weeks, it'll be 20 years here. Wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay, so. Thank you. 2003. 2004. Uh-huh. 2004. Uh-huh. That's okay. exactly right. I'm trying to think of what was happening in LA. It's funny because I was not in LA in 2004. I didn't move back until 2007. What was happening in LA in 2004? In L- you know, I feel like it was such a transitionary time for LA. Um, I First of all, I have to say that the climate has completely changed in the 20 years I've been here. That, yeah. although I would say that that for a very first year I lived here, there was also a deluge of rain, like we've gotten for the last two years. Oh, what? So that's like a, just rainstorms. It, it oh, rained yeah, yeah, from, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rain from like January to April. You know, the entire winter. I thought, why did I move to LA for this? But um, but you know, it, it's it's gotten cooler in the winter and hotter in the summer. And uh, yeah, climate change is real. <laughs> 
not only is climate change real, but it's been real for a long time. And that's, you know, it's funny because that's a, this is actually a great place to start the conversation. You know, I love this because you being a Midwesterner moving to Southern California, I'm a native Angelino who moved to the Midwest. <laughs> and I've been here for a couple of years now. And it's funny because the further away you get from something, the sharper your perspective can be on what, what it was like every time you go back. Absolutely. And I love that our conversation tonight, you and I are having a few pops and talking about googie roadside architecture of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And I love that. And, and the reason I wanted to have this conversation with you, you know, I did a little, a little, a little recon on you and your work and what you do. And, you know, Route 66 is turning 100 yes. this year. And Route 66 was basically what introduced everyone in what I call the flyover states, the design flyovers, about design and mm-hmm. the theater mm-hmm. of design, mm-hmm. right? And the, the request was, and it's funny because these episodes, I, I got to tell you, Patrick, I love doing these episodes, being able to loosen up a little bit and, and it's just so much fun. I'm loving these. What did you, what are your, th- talk to me, tell me your thoughts on LA's roadside and Googie architecture movement. What, what, what's, what do you like about it? What do you hate about it? <laughs> you know, it's so, it's, it's so funny. Um, as a, so my first experience with LA actually was coming here uh, as a kid. I was about seven years old. My parents brought me here on, on vacation and it, man, it just got under my skin and I never forgot about it. And so, um, you know, I moved through my early twenties, but what I remember about those, that, that, that first trip was, you know, we did all the, the sites, we did Disneyland the Coliseum and Dodger stadium and the Chinese and, and Egyptian theaters and things that everybody does. And for me, it, it wasn't the um, entertainment elements of those. It was the architecture that really, really stuck with me. And then um, recognizing when going home growing up that, you know, we had a diner in, in Scottsdale, Nebraska, a little hamburger stand that was obviously Googie architecture. It had the very, very, you know, had the... Uh, flying saucers on the sign had the big cantilevers and something that I, you know, not till years later that I actually was diving into the study of architecture and design. Did I recognize that's what it was, but I was influenced and saw it at a very young age. Um, but, you know, to, I guess to answer your question, what I love about it is it's really, really uh, a couple things. One is that I feel like it just, it stands for optimism, it stands for hope. It stands for the American dream. Um, what I don't like about it is the fact that it's fallen into disrepair, you know, and it's, it's kind of become this, this, uh, I don't want to say a joke of the past, you know, some of it's been well-preserved, but, um, it, what's really interesting to me about Googie is that, it, so it's, it's obviously a mid-century design. It really became popular in the 1950s and between uh, 1900 and 1950, there was just this huge shift from, you know, architecture was very, very classic. It was driven by the classic styles, the Greek and the Roman uh, styles and Beaux-Arts and, and all that. And then the shift between 1900 and 1950, we just kind of go the opposite direction. Everything becomes streamlined. It's obviously influenced by the automobile and, and this move west and you know, all that. Um, but it, it's, it's this huge shift in the way we live and think and, and look at our buildings. And, you know, to me, Googie is really the pinnacle of all of that. It is kind of the, um, the crescendo that then turns into what is modern architecture today. I, I could not possibly agree more. I, and here's what I, here's what's so interesting to me. You know, I think, um, I think a lot of people in our industry forget that architecture by design, no pun intended, is supposed to be a living, breathing embodiment 
of society and culture. And that's why, like, I, I love um, Ron Woodson and Jamie Rummerfield. I, I love, I've known them for years. I love them. We've had some heated discussions when it comes to SIA, you know, Save Iconic Architecture. Yes. Um, we've had some heated discussions because I'm, I'm, I'm a realist. I'm pragmatic. I feel like there has to be a balance between the, the historical value and the iconic nature of architecture. For example, the Neutra VDL house in Silver Lake mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or Silvertop. I, I mean, oh my gosh, amazing, right? Like those, those properties are iconic, literally iconic and need to remain. But the, the Chase Bank that was on Sunset, you know, I, it was a googie. It was, it was yeah. creative. But what's interesting to me about it is that you had you had this modern, these sleek, streamlined, modern ideas that came out of the 1930s into the 1940s. And then you had people who, you know, who said, you know, let's not take ourselves so seriously. Let's have, some, let's have some fun with this. Let's make some high peaks and some weird arches and norms or pans yeah. or yeah. dinas. Let's do yeah. something really cool and fun and unique and it'll be fun. And out of that came mid-century modern design, which kind of embodied both. Mm-hmm. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? No, absolutely. I think I think you're right. I think there is a balance that needs to be struck. I think, unfortunately, it's balanced a little bit in the way of progress, especially in Los Angeles. Um, and I think we've had a we've had a challenging time, uh, m- more so commercially with with commercial buildings. Um, you know, keeping those alive. The reality is, though, that a lot of those were made of concrete, and they were already structurally you know, falling apart. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that, I don't know. I think that it's, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a challenging conversation. I'm always uh, one for preserving something that is special, unique, interesting. Um, and I think that, you know, with, with the example of Chase Bank, that's been an empty lot now for almost a decade. Like, could we not have had it a little bit longer? Um, I don't know. It's, and it's, it's really funny actually. So speaking of Chase Bank and Googie's, Googie's was like across the street from that bank. Originally. Was it really? The, or- yeah. the original so, diner. So the, the original diner that, that, uh, the architectural style is named after that, yeah. that John Lautner designed, mm-hmm. um, was yeah, right there at the intersection of, uh, Crescent Heights and Sunset. See, and, and what's so interesting about it, like if you think about it, and that was, that was what, that was 1949, 1950? Yes, exactly, yeah. 1949. So when you think about this movement, what I love so much about it, and it, it goes, it's personal for me. So like I said, I, I'm a native Angelino. I grew up in the Valley. I was a teenager in the San Fernando Valley in the 1980s. Oh, and you live I, my dream. <laughs> I try, you know, it's funny, Patrick. I try to explain to my kids, you know, my kids, my kids grew up in Manhattan beach and obviously idyllic, amazing, wonderful, great place for them to grow up. But you just can't, you can't make the comparison. Music, culture, uh, just amazing. So my dad would, had season tickets to the Kings when they played at the forum. And from El, from the Valley, we'd hop on the on the 405. I, I feel like that right Saturday Night Live skit. We'd get on the 118 <laughs> to the 405. To the, I live that, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, but we'd get on the 405. We'd zip down to Dinah's. We'd have, have pregame dinner there. And Hans and, is right there, too. And then we'd hit the forum. And yeah. Dinah's just sold. So Dinah's is going to go down. Oh. Dinah's is... Dynas is a dump. I mean, yeah. it, it, it really is. Um, it's old and it has outlived its lifespan. Design has a lifespan. It does. It does. When you think about your work, mm-hmm. 
does how do you think about that do you do you think about the lifespan of your work do you view it i mean because you got one of two options right you view it as a child or a pet and you just want it to live forever on the other side you think it's a creative endeavor that you're doing on behalf of the people who are inhabiting the space and it's not nothing's designed to last forever yeah yeah, you know, I, I think about it um, much more openly the longer I do this. I think in the beginning, everything was just, you're right, like it was my first child. It was so precious. And that, you know, if I came over to a client's house and one thing had moved uh, inside, I'd just be like, <gasps> seething. <laughs> <laughs> but the longer I do this, I'm, I recognize that, first of all, okay, let's just step back here a minute. How crazy is it as a human race that we are attaching buildings out of steel and glass and wood to an ever fluctuating and moving rock like that on its own is kind of a crazy thing that we're doing so especially in los angeles we just see that you know houses move they're living they're breathing and the things that are inside them are living and breathing and and you know it, this idea that they are permanent fixtures is total human construct and kind of silly at the end of the day you know so i've kind of gotten over this like things need to say exactly as they are i think that they're always ever evolving and you know frankly i want them to be because it's that's part of you know repeat business is is what we depend on as designers and if your client doesn't come back 10 or 12 years later and say okay we need to add on a room or recover this or redo all that you know, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm SOL. So, um, yeah, I, I need that evolution in some ways, but also I just think it's, it's the nature of it. You know, I think it's the nature of the fact that these homes and these buildings we live in, I think as humans, we think they're permanent. And I think that it's always funny to me when a client, you know, moves into a brand new house, 8,000 square foot house they paid how many millions of dollars for it and they're like this lo this this wall isn't plumb and I'm like are you great like of course it isn't plumb we're humans cobbling it together like you know to have a little uh, just uh, uh it's you, you have to have reasonable expectations I think of the whole world and it really begins with um the fact that yeah it's it's all organic you know it it's great points all. I think what's interesting for me is as I was kind of prepping for our conversation, you know, it's funny. Oftentimes I will, I'll do a deep dive into something for this. It, it required no deep dive because all it, all it was for me, it's just emotional. It's just, yeah. it's just memory. Like, <laughs> like, you know, going, Hey, I can, I can vividly remember you know, like friends on a Saturday night, getting in my mini truck, five of us and going to the LA Coliseum to go see, a, you know, Echo and the Bunnymen or Boingo Boingo at, at Cal State Northridge during Halloween. But, but, going to the, but going to the Coliseum, get it, you know, getting off in Hollywood and going to Norm's on a Saturday night Yes. And eating with friends and watching all of the cruising and watching all of the cars and the music that was coming out of it. Yes. I can remember that to this yes. day. Yes. And when I, so I was back, I was back in LA before the end of the year. And I went, I went to Norm's cause I was down in La Cienega visiting some folks. Mm -hmm. And um, every time I walk into that particular Norm's, it's just crazy. The memories just flood back. And it's it's some it's purely the architecture. Purely the architecture. I don't isn't isn't that what an what a true art form happens to be? Yeah, that's pretty much the um the definition of iconic. Right? You know, something that that stands for something else. And I, I, just to break that down a little bit further, I mean, that's really what Googie Architecture was about. It was, you know, the building was the advertisement itself. It was the thing that was drawing you inside, not the stuff that was inside, although that was also amazing. 
Um, and just the fact that, you know, the, the fact they were using these giant windows, not just so people could see out, but so people could see in and people could see, I want to be a part of whatever is happening right inside of there. So now, you know, and, and this isn't a, this is not a bash LA conversation because one of the things that I love about Los Angeles and I was having this very conversation at the West Edge Design Fair last year because I had Francis Anderton and just a, a, a great panel. Um, we were talking about, it was all about the, like how people come back to LA to, to reinvent themselves. And that's one of the things that's really cool. But, you know, how great would it be to have the Brown Derby? You know, yeah. the fact that the, that the, um, Cineplex has survived is stunning to me. It's amazing. Right? But against all odds too. Again. <laughs> <laughs> you are not kidding. What does that say? Cuz right now I find and to some people some some of the world's greatest architects disagree with me. But I find I find Los Angeles right now as it relates to architecture a bit antiseptic. I completely agree. It's so, oh, what we're producing right now is so boring for the most part. Even like the Frank Gehry buildings that are going up right now are, are really dull. Well, because um, they've been done. Because, it, but they've been done also, I feel like they've just become so commercial as a firm that they're putting up pretty much boxes, you know? Sure, they're boxes with, they're not 90 degree boxes, but... I just don't think that it, it is a it is a little upsetting to me. Um, I think that, in fact, I was thinking about this um, about this conversation. Other than the uh, forgive me, what's the name of the new uh, Coliseum at the football stadium? Uh, Nokia or no 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 um, Staples Center? Uh, the, the, no, no no the new football stadium in Inglewood. Oh, I have no idea. Uh, it's brand new. And Where LAFC totally plays? Uh, no, where, where, SoFi. um, SoFi, SoFi, SoFi stadium. Thank you. Yeah. That culture is significant, but between that and maybe say the Walt Disney concert hall, I can't really think of a culturally, um, I take it back the Broads, the, uh, Broad museum as well. But yeah. uh, like, I, I just, there, there are so few culturally significant pieces of architecture that are happening or have happened in the past 20 years in Los Angeles, it's sad. You know, when I go to New York City, it's everywhere. It's like just it, what has happened there is so amazing. And what is happening here is kind of dull. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because like I'm a, I'm a big fan of Paul McLean. And the one, I think the one is fantastic. I would rather see that as a hotel than an individual residence because I think it's yes. ridiculous that that's a one person household. I, it's just crazy to me. But as a hotel, that location, that design, I think would be an iconic L.A. moment, right? But I also think, give me your take on this. I think that because there are no more architecture and design critics, that there's no real impetus for groundbreakers, you know, those who, who break ground, you know, it used to be you would do something extraordinary so that you could get it published, not to say that a Kardashian lives in it, but mm -hmm. so that you could say, this is a calling card for what yeah. our firm does. But yeah. it's not like that anymore. Yeah, it's really interesting. I hadn't really, I hadn't really considered that. Um, but it was a pressure. It's... Yes, yes. There, there was a tension to to create, to outdo, to uh, you know make something that somebody else hasn't made. And you're right; that pressure doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and I would say that that it's not just architecture in Los Angeles. No. I would say that applies to the entertainment industry, it applies to you know movies and music and so many things. And I think that I think that, you know, this is a broader conversation, but I think that that's kind of part of the problem is that social media is is basically what what killed this, because anyone can come in and be an asshole 
mm-hmm. anonymously. Yeah. You know, I would I would love it. I I am not bullshitting you. I am totally serious when I tell you this. I would love it if someone came up to me and said, hey, Josh, you know, you did that episode on 1001 North Roxbury, and I think you got it completely wrong. I would be, I would get so it's like, don't just I mean, don't be be contradictory to, to just for the sake of being pr- provocative. But if if you feel like I missed the boat on something or I got something wrong, I would love to have that conversation. I really would. And I think that most designers would like to have a real engaging conversation, not someone just being shitty and saying, well, this looks like a big white box anonymously on social media. Absolutely. Well, because it becomes a dialogue and with conversations and dialogue, that's how opinions change. Or at least that's how people can receive criticism in a non-threatening way. And when you receive criticism in a non-threatening way, then you actually take it to heart. I think, though, that, you know, I mean, you look at the conversations that we've been having over the last and this it's funny because this all goes back to the subject at hand. Right. This goes back to the subject matter of Googie architecture, because I feel like Googies didn't have a long lifespan. They didn't continue making them after mid-century modern kind of exploded on the scene mm-hmm. because that was the more sophisticated embodiment of these very ideas. Mm-hmm. And then there were other things for people to critique. Oh, it's too, it's too antiseptic. It's too, san- it, it's too sanitized. It's too mm-hmm. clean. It's, it's, there's no emotion to, okay, those are valid concerns. Time really is the, is the greatest judge right? Yeah. But I feel like all of the editors went away. Now all the editors went away and just sort of flooded the market with contributors. Mm-hmm. So you've got, you know, and that's why you get like this Sophia Vergara kerfuffle in AD or the Donald Judd kerfuffle again in AD with Kim Kardashian. It's just, it's one of those things where you have to you have to be discovered by the group. It's not mm-hmm. one person saying, "Here's what works. Here's what doesn't." You know, th- and I th- I feel like the dialogue has changed, and I and because of that, you know, to look back at Googies, like there are some things about Googie architecture that are really kind of silly and cartoony, right? Oh, goofy. I mean, it's the Jetsons, <laughs> <laughs> right? But at the same time, like if you walk into Dinah's, and you see those dropped circular, I don't know what you'd call them. I don't know that there's actually a term for it. There's no purpose for it other than to take space. Maybe it's acoustic. I don't know. But I love it. Yeah. 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 It's uh, like I said, you know, it, it, it represents so much. I think the goofiness is the optimism. You know, it, it, it represents just unlimited imagination and saying we're going to try this because it's fun and that's what i really love about mid-century modern architecture and i also think that that's why it had this peak and then you know became nothing was that it was kind of this fever pitch of like everybody's doing it let's do it so let's let's um create let's let's cling on and then everybody's like, oh, this is, this is a little too much. Let's go back to the state and true. Um, but I think that it, what's really cool about it is how many pivotal architects and designers were a part of that, either in the pioneering of it or in the, you know, carrying it over the finish line. And so it just became something that I think that You know, I think it's still really prevalent today. Uh, And I I mentioned the Disney Concert Hall earlier. I think that the Disney Concert Hall is a truly an embodiment of the Googie style. You know, Gary said when he designed that building that he designed it to make it look like sheets of music falling. And so it is an advertisement for what it is. And then when you're inside of it, they use the bright reds and, and, and yellows and golds and their upholstery and carpet as a very organic flow. Like it's gooky architecture, you know? 
And so I don't know. I think it's still very much is something that is prevalent today. We just aren't seeing it. You know, it, it's a very different shape. It's interesting too. So do you, would you consider the LA theme building at the LA airport Googie? I know it's classified as that, you know, so when was that built? It was built, was it built in the 40s? Because um, I feel like it actually predates Googie. Am I wrong? Uh, you know what? Or is it, no, 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 wait. Yeah, I was going to say, is it the, or is it later in the 60s? I can't, I... 61. Okay, so it's much later. Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's Googie, but it's also theme. Oh, it's funny, it's called the theme building. But like, uh, you know, theme architecture is, talk about something that is so LA-centric. You know, really starting with the Brown Derby and, and even the Hollywood sign really is is theme architecture. Randy Stonuts and and so I feel like, you know, Googie is kind of this this convergence of theme and modernist and then the theme building, yeah, yeah, it's Googie. For sure it's Googie. Um it's definitely one of those what the is that and I wanna go inside. <laughs> And I think that's you know kind of what it is. Yeah, but you know what's interesting? As it, this is, I bring it up because this is one of those examples to me where form, function. Form, brilliant. Function, absolute failure. Meaningless. Absolutely. Well, because it's you can't empty do anything. It has for at least 20 years, yeah. You can't make you can't make a successful concept restaurant there. You can't make it into an observation deck. You can't, there's just no I mean, talk about a missed opportunity. Yeah. What a missed opportunity. I mean, that should be uh, that should be a mint. It should be a gold mine. You should it should be an LA attraction. Not looking at it, because you show that building to anyone in the world, and I would be shocked if you didn't get. 80% plus recognition for that building. Yeah. Well, look what they've done with the TWA uh, terminal at, at in New York. It's, a, it's the same thing. You know, yeah. they, uh, I think part of it is that we have, we have so poor um, transit in Los Angeles that going to LAX is the biggest soul sucking adventure that you possibly could do. It really is. <laughs> If I can avoid it, I do everything to avoid it. Um, so I think I think a lot of it has to do with location. I think a lot of it. Do you know what's really interesting though? It's funny you mention that because traffic. It's like every time I go back home to LA, I'm I always leave way earlier than I need to so that I can be on time, mm -hmm. and it always gets worse. And by the way, it's been getting worse since I was a teenager. <laughs> it's, it's been it I've never been there gets like, better. 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night and yeah. it takes but, an hour to get around that loop. <laughs> when I got my driver's license in 1986, 85 is when I got my driver's license. You I could, I could get to Orange County. I could get to Long Beach from the Valley. It would take me 25, 30 minutes. <laughs> any day, wow. any day, you know, going when we when I go with friends, we go dancing, we go to the palace or Florentine Gardens in mm -hmm. in Hollywood. 15 minutes. Wow. Yeah. And so it's interesting, though, because I feel like the reason that architecture. The architecture had had purpose. It was it was meaningful. It was a it was a stop on a on a on a cruise. It was if a destination. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, well, if you're cruising in on La Cienega, Norms was was a spot. You know, yeah. if you're cruising Sunset, Mel's Diner was a spot at one mm -hmm. point. You know, and you had you had all of these really interesting locations. And by the way, Route sixty six they created basically this what 1300 mile theme park basically yeah. which is just extraordinary because you don't see that anymore 
Yeah, there's no, there's no, well, I mean, I think the internet is our new highway. So there is no through line through, through regions and through communities that link you to, you know, Chicago to San Francisco. It, we don't think that way anymore. We don't act that way anymore. No. And, but you know, what's interesting. So you talk about, you talk about that route. So growing up, were, were road trips big for you when you were growing up? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I lived in Nebraska. There's nothing that is, you know, less than 50 miles close to anything else. So yeah, I spent most of my time on the road as a kid. <laughs> okay. So me too. And that route going LA, San Francisco, because once you got out of Santa Barbara, then you got the um, Madonna Inn in San Luis Obispo. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Which is just fun. That's so cool. And then you got F. McClintock's there. You've got... Um, You've got the Winchester Mystery House in, in uh -huh, San Jose. Uh -huh. So you've got, it's the same thing where you've got the missions, where you can stop at all the missions along the yeah. way, which is, again, it's, it's purposeful architecture. It's purpose in design, which I, I don't feel that anymore, which I think, going back to the original argument, do you think that's why so many people get so upset when these landmarks disappear because of that memory and there's nothing to replace it? Absolutely. Because there is nothing to replace it. The thing that's replacing it has, has no soul. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely it. Are you, are you ever tempted as a, as a creative, as a creator, to, to embrace some of the I don't, I don't want to call them fads because I don't think they were fads. I think they were, I, I would, I would more generalize them as stepping stones, mm -hmm. you know, where you can look at it, you, rings on a tree. You know, you can tell when this happened by looking at it, the standard oil gas station on what La Brea and I don't even know the cross, but it's, it's up near Baldwin it's near, Hills. It's near, oh, okay. I was thinking of the one on Robertson and, not uh, in Beverly Hills, Hills, but the other one uh, near Baldwin yeah. Hills. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Which which has the car wash too, and the the way that the building was designed, it looks like you're driving up into the car wash, and then you just kind of disappear into the sky. It's uh -huh. amazing. It's this optical illusion that they that they did through the through the architecture. No, you don't see that anymore. Yeah, I think that. Um... I think that, first of all, that's creating things like that became uneconomical. You know, everything is so bottom line driven these days commercially that unless it's in a theme park or unless it's in a destination that is behind a wall to, you know, just designed to suck as many dollars out of your pocket as possible, it just doesn't financially make sense to do it. So... You know, I, I think that that's why mostly we don't see things like that. Um, but I think that also just the engineering expense of that, you know, hiring, hiring all the creative minds to create these things isn't, just isn't in our value set anymore. Interesting. Hold that thought. I'm going to go get a refill. <laughs> Excellent. Me too. Okay. I'll be right back. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. This is fun. This is fun. This is the first podcast I've done where there's a uh, drinking involved, and um, I, I may, I may just start introducing. I may just start introducing <laughs> this to all of them. <laughs> I think it could be a whole whole podcast concept on its own. Do you, do you think that we will ever get back to a point? I mean, look, architecture and design are investments there is a significant and substantial cost. Do you think we'll ever get back to the point where there can be a level of experimentation where we're not, we're not doing a Cape Cod mod, which is basically just the same white, big white boxes now with a different color blue for trim? Yeah, I, I don't know. That's hard. I hope so. I really, really hope so. And I think that, if it does happen, it will because it will be because it, it, kind of a response to 
we've been living in this global, global world. We've been saturated with social media. We've been uh, pulled in all these different directions. And eventually, I hope, because I'm starting to get there, that I just want to shut down from all of it and be hyper, hyper local again. And live a little bit more simply and live a little bit with less. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing. I do think it's still happening in residential architecture and design, which is why I do that. Yeah. You know, that obviously people are willing to still spend that money and that investment in their individual lives. Um, will we get back there? Uh, in society as a whole? I don't know. It may not happen in our lifetime. Well, and it's interesting because when I say that, by the way, I'm not taking a shot. Uh, architects and designers are, you, you provide a service to your clients. That's right. If, if every client is asking for a Cape Cod mod, you're going to do it because that's your job. Um, it's kind of like, you, you know, back in the, back in the seventies and eighties tower records. Do you remember tower records on sunset? Yes. Um, so tower records used to have the album covers like hand painted, blown up yes. hand painted album covers for whatever was, what had just dropped and amazing, just the coolest thing. And you'd have these guys who just are, absolute artists who may be house painters or maybe, you know, something else, but they did these projects and it allowed them to, to do their art um, in a meaningful, substantial way. And I think that that is so cool. I feel like um, in LA in particular, I think the ADU, the explosion of ADUs is almost giving permission to see what you can do with it. It started with the containers, right? And now it's yes. like, yes. hey, maybe I can do something kooky and, and fun with this. Right. Maybe I have a, a, a Spanish mission style house, but I'm going to do this, you know, very, very contemporary glass and seal attachment to the back of my house, which can turn my garage into it. Or, yeah, absolutely. Um, I love when I see homes that are just this like conversion of two, I'm sorry, not conversion, convergence of two different styles of like two things that should not go together that, that absolutely, you know, work together and sing. Um, uh, it's really exciting to me. Um, and yeah, it like, it is happening in residential design. It is the only place that I really am seeing exciting, uh, innovative architecture right now. It, it's it's challenging because you know I'm not sure that in this day and age the googies would have ever even got off the ground. I don't know that there would have been anyone who was so experimental in thought. They're too they weird. Would, they're too right? <laughs> they're, they're too goofy. They're too. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny like. They're very, very attractive. They're very tantalizing. But when you really break it down, the, you know, the red, the orange, the yellow, it's like, it's a lot. It's a lot. You could not live in that. You couldn't spend more than an hour and a half in that. Like, you know, it, it's a assault on all the senses in a lot of ways. Do you know so, what's funny, though? Like, if if I think about it, I could totally live... <laughs> In I, I could. I mean, obviously, if it's not a restaurant, because it's it's restaurants and gas stations. I mean, that's pretty much yeah. it. I don't know. Aside from, okay, I don't know if you could qualify this, but the the Wallace Neff Bubble House, mm -hmm. could you qualify that as a googie? I I think so. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. There's. I mean, there's even so many like. John Lautner homes that are like, this is on the verge of a theme building. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's granted, like, they, I was gonna say that they look more like, you know, James Bond villain <laughs> layers than they do actual homes, but you know, it'd be a fun place to, to stay for a weekend. Yeah. Did you ever have a chance to tour the, the Wallace, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the, the 
Neutra VDL house in Silver Lake? I have not. No, or yeah, so, I did not know. It's so interesting. It's a it's a it's a large envelope. It's a big enclosure. Mm-hmm. But there are some like Dione's room is is chopped up into such a small residence, and and it's they took elements from a ship where her bed is on a is on a is on a pivot so that it comes to make it you pull it away you you pull it away from the bed from the wall to make it and then you swing it back to to make room and you've got this huge house but ev- there's a there's an elevator it can't fit more than one person in it but there is an elevator it's just yeah. the oh, it's so odd those the, homes weren't designed for the bedroom and the bathroom and the kitchen right. they were designed for the main living spaces the entertaining mm-hmm. spaces the spaces that you actually spent your time in and they were specifically done that way you know um Frank Lloyd Wright over and over is 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 interviewed and quoted saying that I'm not designing this house for the bedroom, you know, it is about the primary spaces. And so and it's really funny because it's almost like a, a cruise ship in that way or a hotel in that way that that or at least the way yeah. hotels were made back in the day. That it's it wasn't about the space that you stayed overnight. It was about the space that you spent the rest of your time in. So it's funny you say that, and I, I can send you pictures if you want, but it's the craziest thing. So here in Tulsa, the architecture here is is amazing. Bruce Goff, um, who who worked on the um, the I think it's it's the Japanese uh, building at LACMA. At LACMA, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, um, I've but heard he also there's did, a lot of great mid century modern architecture in Tulsa. It's amazing. So about forty miles away from where I am is the uh, is Frank Lloyd Wright's Price Tower, which is his one and only skyscraper. Yes. So I went and toured it and did a sit down with the docent. And we went up to the to the 19th, 20th floor, 19th floor to see Mr. Price's office, which for so many reasons, it was just so wrong on so many different levels <laughs> down to the down to little details. And this goes back to like the, the whole Googie thought process. So the fireplace. It's 1950 something, 55, 50 something. It's the only skyscraper in a downtown area. To this day, there's bigger buildings, but if you go, it's the only, it's just, it's very odd. But you're on this, you're on the 20th floor in the off, in what was his office. And the fireplace was not built horizontally. It was built vertically so that you would, when you put the logs in, you put the logs in vertically and lean them. Uh, I know you're picking up what and I'm also, putting down. A wood burning fireplace on the 20th floor of a building. <laughs> in the, yes. And hence the need for a custom made mesh metal screen because the logs yeah. would always fall over. I mean, <laughs> just so wacky. It's, and it's so much that is like just. Ah, human ego, man. I mean, it is the force that drives architecture and design at the end of the day. Yeah. But what was interesting too is to your point. To your point, the um the kitchen in these in these each apartment. Now it's a hotel. You can actually go stay in this hotel, which is really cool. But there were apartments, and in the apartments, the kitchens were just minuscule. So tiny, so like small. 10 square feet, yeah. <laughs> if that. Um, but everything had a place and there was a place for everything. Mm-hmm. And everything was vertical. And I, I feel like that is sort of representative of, of this Googie style. And what you even see to this day, you know, I was looking on um, I was looking on your website, and there's a hero image of a of a beach house. And this beach house, it's it's beautiful, by the way. It was really impeccably done. And you've got this view out to the water. But as you go up, the ceiling continues to climb. Mm -hmm. And then you've got you've got vertical and horizontal windows at the top, which kind of just it draws the eye up. Now, if we're in a traditional architecture environment, that's not there. Right. 
you know, that's that's influenced by the a, a mid-century modern idea, which was arguably influenced by this brief googie period of time, because before that, everything was sanitary boxes. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting to see how these ideas progress and grow and take on a life of their own. And it feels to me like you're only stifled by your own level of creativity. That's absolutely right. Well, I've had budget. <laughs> budget. But when, <laughs> when the dollars become, you know, and I mentioned that 1001 North Roxbury situated that episode, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to it, but it was that particular property in Beverly Hills where the, the founder of, I think it was founder of StubHub, he and his wife came in and bought the, the property um, it was a gorgeous house. It was, it was published in Lux. It was published in AD. It was a beautiful property. And they bought it for like $49 million just to tear it down. Wow. It, you so know, for, and my argument was, I'm not upset about that. And I'm not upset about it because someone who has more dollars and cents can come in and if they can afford it, they can buy it. If they want to live there, it's their, it's their property. They can do what you want. Now I feel for the neighbors. I can empathize for the people who would walk their dog by that house every day. I would, I would empathize and, and sympathize for the people who, who thought, you know, Esther Williams used to swim in that pool. Jack Benny lived on one side and Lucille Ball lived on the other. Right. That's, that's kind of tragic. You know, at the end of the day, they still lived there. They, that's still what that neighborhood is, but I don't live there. So I can't be mad about it because I don't own it. But there is something, there is something joyful to me about driving by norms. Or <laughs> well, you know what I mean? Or that Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, because because you have you have a personal direct connection. No, same, same for me. I've spent many, many and after hours at that norms on La Cienega or the Mel's on Sunset. And yeah, I have memories of doing ridiculous things inside those places when I was much younger. So yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a nostalgia to it all. And, you know, the funny thing is I, I feel like nostalgia is what, what it, one of the driving factors of, of Googie style and Googie architecture yeah. it is, it is creating the space for reminiscing. It is creating the space for dreaming and hoping and wishing. Um, it's creating spaces that are, really big, really, you know, the feel because of the size of the windows, because of the cantilevers, because of whatever else that feel uh, infinite maybe isn't the right word, but they just feel expansive and they are a space for connecting and belonging, which is really what design and architecture is at the end of the day. It, it is, it is. And, you know, sort of as we wrap this up, um, back to the, 1980s and my high school spring breaks in Palm Springs as Sonny Bono, mayor of Palm Springs, was trying to <laughs> shut down spring break and rightfully so. Um, but anytime you've got, you know, thousands of teenagers it, dropping into this one small community, but that city was dying, dying until Coachella came in. I was going to say Coachella. <laughs> yeah. And until the, this whole community of modern architecture and design lovers from L.A. Mm -hmm. said, hey, we can we can we like the six million dollar man, we can rebuild him. We can rebuild yeah. this. Yeah. And they did. And it is extraordinary. But as you drive in Highway 111, you have the Palm Springs Welcome Center with the big cantilever. With the, I mean, yes, you, could, you yes. could shave on the point. You really, I, it's amazing. It is Googie incarnate. Yeah, and I, I long for the days like when somebody will get adventurous again to say, and and I don't think we're far away from that. I think you know, to your point, it's budgets. Yeah, but I think there's there's sort of this joy in looking back at what was and saying, hey, it can be again. It doesn't have to be the same way, but let's take what worked and experiment again. Well, it'll happen in hospitality first then. You which think? Which makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because that's, 
you know, I think that that is the one place commercially where we are, we are willing to bet. We're willing to put a little extra money uh, because something might just work. Which is funny, that's exactly where Googie started too. Okay, so we need to get you a hotel project. <laughs> I love this. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Neo Googie, here I come. <laughs> No, I love this. This is so great. All right. So listen, as we, as we, this was great. This was so much fun. Um, as we wrap this up, you and I, you're going to get the convo by design treatment. Um, I'm going to see you in LA in May. So as yeah. this is probably airing, you and I are going to be getting together in the, in the real world to awesome. have a IRL. I'm very excited. Oh, this is going to be great. I'm so excited about this. Very cool. Thank you so much, Josh. This was this was uh, really fun. Patrick, this was amazing. Thank you for doing this. And I'm excited to, uh, uh, to see you in LA. I'll see you soon. Sounds great. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Awesome. Loved our chat. Thank you for drinking and talking about architecture and design. We need to do this again and soon. Thank you to my partner sponsors, Thermosol, Design Hardware, Pacific Sales, Monogram, and TimberTech. They support this show because they have a passion for the design industry. They have remarkable companies built to serve, and my hope is that you will give them a chance to earn your business. Check the show notes for links, and I have personally vetted each of these companies. So if you have questions, ask me. Email me, convo by design at outlook.com or on Instagram at convo by design with an X. Thank you again for taking the time to listen and subscribe. Cheers.